Okay, in a previous video, we defined the notion of a ring and we looked at some examples. So in this video, we want to look at five special cases of rings. In other words, like some types of rings that have added structure, um, look at how they relate to each other and give some examples of those. So uh, we'll say that if R has a multiplicative identity and we, we generally call that one, then we say R is a ring with one. Sometimes a ring with identity, but often it's just written as a ring with one. Then if AB equals BA, in other words, the multiplication is commutative, then R is called a commutative ring. If R is commutative with one um, and if AB equals zero, that implies that A equals zero or B equals zero, then R is called an integral domain. If A inverse exists for all non-zero elements of R, then R is called a division ring. And then finally, a commutative division ring is called a field. So um, we have a chart of the inclusion of all of these things. So rings are the most general, fields are the most restrictive, and then we go uh, from the top to the bottom from more general to more restrictive. So right off of rings, we have commutative rings and rings with one. Obviously, you could put something in the middle here called commutative rings with one, but um, I won't really worry about that because that'll make that a little bit messy. We have integral domains, which are both commutative rings and rings with one, but they also satisfy another condition um, that if a, b equals zero, then a equals zero or b equals zero. Then we have a division ring, which it may not be an integral domain because it's not, it may not be commutative, um, but it is a ring with one. And then we have fields, which are obviously going to be integral domains and division rings, and then all the way up. Okay, so uh, let's go ahead and write some examples here um, just to get a feel for what's going on. So uh, let's say maybe rings with one, we could have n by n matri matrices with entries in the real numbers. So that would be an example of a ring with an identity. The identity matrix would be the identity. And then we could have uh, maybe uh, functions. Uh, from R to R. So notice that's a ring with one because that has uh, the identity function as uh, one of the elements. Um, okay, good. And then, and then over here, let's look at some commutative rings. And so we wanna make sure they don't have any of these other properties. So commutative rings, maybe uh, 2Z, 3Z, Etc. Those are examples of commutative rings. They do not have identity because these are all multiples of two, these are all multiples of three. So in fact, uh, we're not allowed to get the number one in there because that's not a multiple of two or of three or of so on and so forth. Um, we could have uh, those. Then we could also maybe have something which is like x times z of x. So let's say that's going to be a1x plus a2x squared plus dot dot dot, um, where these ai's are in z. In other words, all polynomials that are degree one or higher. So notice there's going to be no identity in there either. Okay, now something that's a commutative ring with one would be like zn. No, no, now notice for an arbitrary n, this is not an integral domain. Uh, let's think about z6 maybe. The number 2 and the number 3 are not 0 inside of z6, but 2 times 3 is equal to 6, which is 0. So that's not an integral domain. Now, moving on to integral domains, the integers is an uh, example of an integral domain, and in fact, the notion of the integral domain is really just a generalization of the integers themselves. Um, we could hack together some other things that are integral domains, like uh, z adjoint x is an integral domain, um, and so on and so forth. Okay, so now what about division rings? So this is something we'll prove more carefully as a division ring. It's called uh, the quaternions. And so this is going to be everything of the form A plus BI plus CJ plus DK, where A, B, C, and D are real numbers. And then I won't write it down right here, but I, J, and K um, satisfy the multiplication in inside of the quaternion group. 
And so that multiplication is non-commutative, but you in fact do get um, uh, inverses for everything. And now for fields down here, uh, some fields would be like ZP, where P is a prime. That's something that we'll check later. And then also Q, also R, also the complex numbers. And you can actually hack together a bunch of other examples of fields as well. Okay, so I'm going to clean up the board and then we'll maybe look at uh, some of these more carefully. So this first example I want to look at is uh, the example of Zn. So if n is a composite number, then Zn is a commutative ring with 1. So that's pretty trivial to check. The multiplication is obviously going to be commutative and then our multiplicative identity will be uh, 1. In other words, the equivalence class of 1. But it is not an integral domain. And so let's go ahead and prove that. So since if n is composite, then we can write n as a times b with a and b both between 1 and n. So not equal to 1 and not equal to n. And so what that tells us is that um, a is not equal to 0 inside of Zn, um, and b is also not equal to 0 inside of Zn, but um, a times b is equal to n, which is equal to 0 inside of Zn, which makes this thing not an integral domain. So uh, let's go ahead and look at an example. So notice that uh, we have 3 and 5 in Z15, and notice neither of those are equal to 0 inside of Z15. Remember, in order to be equal to 0 inside of Z15, you need to be a multiple of 15, but neither of those are multiples of 15. But now let's go ahead and look that uh, 3 times 5 is equal to 15, which is equal to 0 in Z15. So uh, let's look at another example real quick. So let's notice that 6 and 10 are in Z15, and neither of those are equal to 0 either, but... 6 times 10 is the same thing as 60, which is the same thing as 4 times 15, which is 0 in Z15. So this shows us that Z15 is not an integral domain. Okay, I'll clean up the board and then we'll prove a couple more claims like this. So the next thing we want to look at is this claim, which says that if P is a prime number, then ZP is a field. So uh, let's look at the proof. So we're not going to prove everything. Notice this is kind of obviously a commutative ring with 1. And we saw that because that's true for all of Zn, so we don't really need to check that it's a commutative ring with 1. Um, and now uh, let's go ahead and show that it's an integral domain. So let's suppose that A, B are in ZP with uh, A times B is equal to zero inside of ZP. Okay, so let's recall what it means to be zero inside of ZP. So what that means is that A times B is congruent to zero mod P. Okay, but being congruent to zero mod P means that P divides A times B. But finally, because P is a prime, that means P divides A or P divides B. But now we can just work right out of this and we will end up with A equals zero in ZP or B equals zero in ZP, which is exactly what we need in order for this to be um, an integral domain. Okay, so now let's go ahead and show that it is a field. In other words, every non-zero element has an inverse. So let's go ahead and suppose that we have a non-zero element, A, which is in ZP. But notice that since this is non-zero in ZP, that immediately tells us that P does not divide A. In other words, the GCD of A and P equals 1. Okay? But what that tells us is that there exists x and y, which are both integers, 
such that AX plus PY equals one. So we can get that from the extended Euclidean algorithm. If we had actual like fixed numbers here, this is like a sort of a well-known fact. Okay, but now what we want to do is look at this equation modulo P, and that will tell us that AX is congruent to one mod P. In other words, a inverse equals x inside of zp. So what we did, we started with a non-zero element of zp and we found its inverse. So in other words, every non-zero element has an inverse. Okay, so this is a nice example of a finite field. In other words, a field with a finite number of elements. Okay, I'll clean up the board, then we'll look at an example of a division ring. Okay, so the next thing we want to do is show that this set forms a division ring. Um, so let's go ahead and add that in here, is a division ring. And so this is known as the quaternion ring. Um, sometimes the quaternion algebra because it's actually a vector space over R and that makes it something called an algebra which we'll maybe talk about later. So notice this is all linear combinations of uh, just the number one, so it's A times the number one, B times I, C times J, and D times K. So A, B, C, and D are in R, and then the multiplication between I, J, and K is given by the following rules. And so these rules are exactly as what's happening inside of Q8. In other words, the quaternion group. So we have I squared equals J squared equals K squared equals negative 1, and then we have this multiplication. So I times J is K, J times K is I, K times I is J, and then if you reverse the order, um, you pick up a minus sign. So uh, if you recall, you can uh, easily see this by drawing this loop. Uh, I to j, j to K, and if you go in the direction of the arrows, you pick up a plus sign. If you go in the opposite direction, you pick up a minus sign. So I times J is K, K times J is minus I, and uh, so on and so forth. Okay, so we want to show that this is a division ring. So it's really clearly a ring with one, and notice just the number one, and I should say maybe plus zero I plus zero J plus zero K um, in H, that's the identity element. So that's really obvious. Now, the next thing we want to do is find an inverse. And what I want to uh, notice is that we can construct an inverse very easily. And so how would you get this? Probably from just being inspired by the inverses inside of the complex numbers um, and then messing around with it for a little bit. And so we have A plus BI plus CJ plus DK. And then the inverse of this whole thing will be formed by the following. So this is going to be A minus BI minus CJ minus DK over A squared plus B squared plus C squared plus D squared. Okay, so that is my claim, and I will prove that claim by uh, doing some multiplication. So I'll take A plus BI plus CJ plus DK and multiply it by this thing, and we'll see that we get the identity, which makes this thing the inverse of this guy that's in the um, inside of these parentheses. So I'm going to factor out the 1 over A squared plus B squared plus C squared plus D squared out front, and now I need to do A plus BI plus plus CJ plus DK times A minus BI minus uh, CJ minus DK. Okay, great. And so I'm just going to bring this down. I have 1 over A squared plus B squared plus C squared plus D squared. And now let's see what we get for our uh, things that are multiplied by the number one. In other words, the pure real parts. So I get that from doing A times A, which is A squared. So I'll put this in red parentheses. And then I have BI times minus BI. And so that's going to be minus BI squared, but I squared is negative one. So that's going to give me plus B squared. 
okay? And then I have CJ times minus CJ. So just as uh, before, that's gonna give me positive C squared, so the minus and the J squared will cancel. And then I very similarly have plus D squared. Okay, so now if that's the only thing that's non-zero, then I'm good to go because I divide that by A squared plus B squared plus C squared plus D squared, and I get the identity. And notice, I'm assuming that not all of these are zero because in other words, I would have the zero element, and that does not need to have an inverse. Okay, so now let's go ahead and look at uh, the coefficient of I. So maybe I'll put these in blue. So the coefficient of i, so let's see how we can get the coefficient of i. We can get j times k, so notice if we do, that will be c times minus d, so that's going to give us minus c d, that's going to give me the coefficient of i. Um, I can also get it by doing k times j, but I pick up a minus sign. So if I do k times j, then I'm going to get another minus c times d, but then I have but then I have k times j, which is negative i, so that's gonna change this minus sign to a plus sign, that's gonna give me plus cd, which causes these things to cancel to zero. Okay, so now let's do one more. Um, I'll leave you to do the k component by yourself, um, but let's do the j component. Okay. So notice that we can get the j component one way by doing k times i. So let's see. That's going to be uh, dk times negative bi. So k times i is j, so that's going to give me negative bd. Okay, good. And then I can get it another way by doing bi. Uh, times negative dk, but now I'm going to have i times k, but i times k is negative j, so that's going to flip this minus bd to a plus bd, so I have plus bd here, and then that's going to cancel to zero. And then similarly, which I won't write, the k term also cancels to zero. So let's see what we're left with. We're left with 1 over a squared plus b squared plus c squared plus d squared times a squared plus b squared plus c squared plus d squared. So that gives us 1. In other words, we have proven the statement here that the inverse of this guy is equal to this, which tells us that every non-zero element has an inverse, but this thing is not commutative, so that makes this thing not a field, but a division ring. Okay, so I think this is a good place to end this video.